today's video will be on the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 5. Can you believe we've made it this far already? Someday, we'll even have the entire Constitution down. That'll be a good day. So we're going to start off with the complete text and then go over each clause individually. Each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members, and a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business. But a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members, in such manner and under such penalties as each house may provide. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. Each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings, and from time to time publish the same, excepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy. And the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. Neither house during the session of Congress shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. Clause 1. So this one's interesting to me as I've never really thought about this, but the Senate and House can essentially be their own judicial branch for their own members. They can investigate their own members, hold trials, and even dole out warrants and punishments for failure to show. All the normals rule apply, like perjury and such as well. On top of that, this clause is really describing that there has to be a certain number of people, a quorum, and in this case, that number was a majority to do business, like make laws. It was argued that having it any less would give members who lived a long distance away less representation, and that was unfair, even though it was considered a great inconvenience to get there to vote. Remember, a horse and buggy times. Even though this majority was lower than what was wanted because they really wanted everybody, it turned out to still cause problems. Even a quorum was required to vote to pass laws. If a side didn't want a law to pass and they were the minority, they'd show up since they could be compelled to intend, but then just refuse to vote. It took till 1890 for this to be changed to make it harder to do this and only require the number of members attending to meet the requirement not the number of people voting. Things like this allow me to look at the current Congress and know that the tomfoolery that happens isn't new. It may take different forms and might in some ways be more extreme, but it comes from a long-standing tradition of tomfoolery. Clause 2. Rules. The Senate and the House get to make their own rules. So long as they don't ignore constitutional restraints on their power nor violate fundamental rights, that's it. Really. Seriously, a lot of room there to do whatever they want. There have been some arguments over when, where, and by what number of votes are needed to expel a member versus exclude them, which are different, but those would be the most notable times when other branches of the government stepped in to determine something was outside of the rulemaking capacity of the House. The biggest issue with expulsion is that if you remove someone, you'll have the problem that the people themselves may no longer trust the Congress to enact their will, since essentially they voted this person in in the first place and then the Congress kicked them out. Exclusions are even harder since this would be a person voted in and the Congress just doesn't let them join. A similar bag of worms as they had by adjusting requirements essentially to even be a Congress member. The continuing debate is whether expulsions can happen for things that took place before the member was elected, even if it was found out after they were already in Congress. Thankfully, misconduct while a member of Congress has pretty much been settled as a possibility for expulsion, but still doesn't happen consistently. The most recent situation in which this even is a topic is with George Santos, since he's been elected and fulfills the requirements to join the House. It's unlikely he won't be able to join, unless he resigns, of course, uh, despite lying essentially on every possible option of his past. And then, even if the House investigates him, finding all of his claims to be completely false, it is unlikely he'd even be expelled, especially considering that the Republicans are gaining the majority of the House 
and it would require a majority voted to expel a Congress member. That's the kind of tomfoolery I'm talking about. Clause three. This is really that they need to just record their votes and the bills that come before them in the House and Senate. Their reasoning for this was that public eyes on proceedings would prevent Congress from actively going against the government or the American people. It would also allow the public to go back in time and compare what someone is saying they did with their words later on. All of this is to build confidence in the proceedings that take place and the journal is considered unimpeachable factual truth about what happened. It is so valued uh, that we even keep the records in the journals from a long time ago. You can just go to the Library of Congress's page and see things way back in the 1800s and 1700s for this. In the centuries since the Constitution was created, we've adapted some of this to, say, like public video proceedings, along with online resources keeping track of votes. However, it has been noted that most of the public doesn't really care about this information, and it doesn't prevent people from lying about their track record, nor the sort of underhanded tactics that might take place without actively watching eyes. And this was even pointed out way back when that people would pretty much find these proceedings and this information boring and not participate in that political process where it essentially destroys the checks and balances the people have on the Congress simply due to lack of interest. Clause 4. This is just stipulating that unless the House and Senate both agree, neither can adjourn for more than three days. They have some pretty standardized adjournments now, so many that in fact the Senate averaged only 162 days of meetings per year over the course of the two year time period of 2019 to 2021. Yeah, that's a little less than half the year. That isn't to say they aren't doing job related activities outside of those days, but those are the only required days for them to be in session. And even then those meetings don't have to be a full quote unquote work day. And with a salary of $174,000 per year, I'm wondering why I'm not attempting to be a Congress member more actively. All right. And that's it for this one. Uh, we got through a lot of information in this section and we'll continue to plow through the rest of it. So see you next time. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.